Good morning, and welcome to the services here at the Carthage Church of Christ. If you would like to, please turn to uh, Paul's epistle to the Romans. We're going to be reading from chapter 3, verses 10 through 18 here in one moment. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18. We are so glad to see each and every one of you out with us uh, this morning. Members, we're glad to see you. Uh, visitors, we are delighted uh, at your presence uh, if you are visiting with us uh, at this time. Uh, one of our ushers, Brother Barry Cook, is going to pass down the center aisle. He is going to have a visitor's packet um, to give out to you that's got some information on the congregation of the Lord's Church that meets here. And it's also going to have a visitor's card. We ask that you fill that visitor's card out um, for us um, and pass it uh, to the center aisle. Uh, that way we'll have a record uh, of your attendance with us uh, today. Uh, if you are visiting, we would like to ask you to uh, stay around for a little bit and join us in Bible study preceding this service. Uh, allow us to get to know you a little bit better and to join us uh, in our study of God's Word uh, after this worship service. Uh, again, we will be reading from Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18 to begin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They all have turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their thought is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their fear are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That was the reading of Romans chapter 3, verse 10 through 18. At this time we'll begin our song service led by Brother Andy Rutherford. like to use your book. Our first song this morning will be 891. Of course, all these will be on the PowerPoint as well. Number 891. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made, that the Yeah. 
215. 215 after this song will be led in our opening prayer. We'll sing the first and fourth thing. Hear me when I call, O oh God, my righteousness, unto Thee I come in weakness and distress. Oh, my trembling hand, Mighty God and Father in heaven, we're so grateful unto thee for this day and the many wonderful blessings of it. We're so grateful this morning for the time and opportunity that we have to come together, study a portion of thy word, and render service unto thee. Dear Father, we pray that we'll be acceptable in thy sight. We're so thankful for the good health that you bless us with and enables us to be here. We're mindful of those, Father, who are sick and unable to be with us. We pray that thy blessings will be upon them. We pray that you'll be with my blessings will be upon those who minister unto them, that they may be up and be back with us soon, if it be thy will. Have those of our community, dear Father, that we pray for at this time, who are grieving due to the loss of loved ones. We pray that thy comfort in hand will be upon them. Help us to be a strength and encouragement to those as well, dear Father. We're so thankful for the church that meets at this place, dear Father. We're thankful for its elders and its deacons. We pray that we're thankful for each member. We pray that as we work together that we're here at this place that we'll do so in unity that the borders of thy kingdom may spread from our efforts. We're so grateful for thy ministering servants who work with us, Brother Edward and Brother Justin. We pray that thou will be with them and be with their families and give them success in the things that they do to, board, to spread the borders of thy truth. Dear Father, we're so grateful that thou sent thy son on this earth, give us the opportunity to someday live today. We pray, that, dear Father, that as we, we often sin and fall short of thy, thy glory, we pray that thou will forgive us and help us to stand pure and justified before thee. Pray, dear Father, as we're going through this service this morning, that thou will be with us, keep us through this day. Bless us as it pleases thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For those who wish to mark in their songbook, our invitation song this morning will be number 207. 207. Before the lesson, we'll sing number 527. 527. We'll sing the first and third stanzas of this, and let's stand as we sing this song. As I travel through life with trouble and strife, I'm glorious, hope to give cheer on the way. Soon my soul will be o'er, and I'll rest on that shore, where the night has been turned into day. Up in the beautiful paradise, I leave my side. In the valley 
have enjoyed a wonderful period of singing and prayer, and we come now to a time wherein we will be studying God's Word. We ask you to take your Bible and be prepared to some of the scriptures as we mention them. If you would like to take notes on this morning's lesson, a couple of our ushers will be coming down the aisle and will have for you a handout to whereon you can write those scriptures down and and make some points or write some points that you may want to remember and to help you to appreciate more fully those things that are being said uh, from God's Word. We are delighted to have some visiting with us this morning, and uh, we are honored by your presence, and we do hope that you will come and be with us every time that you have the opportunity to so do. We're studying a lesson this morning that I have chosen to simply entitle Walls. I don't know if any of you have ever visited Walls Drug Store up in South Dakota. Well, I know W.A. Gibbs has. Barbara and I have been there. You see these signs for miles and miles and miles and miles and miles and miles across South Dakota along the interstate. Visit Walls Drug Store. It's supposed to be the largest drug store in the world. And uh, I'll tell you, we didn't see very much of it. We didn't stay there long. It was so expensive that we didn't want to stop. And it was, it was interesting. We're not talking about that walls this morning. Uh, we're not talking about just any type walls because uh, uh, though we're going to mention some of them generally speaking. In Acts chapter 9, verse 25, there are the walls around the city of Damascus that are mentioned. Paul, you'll remember, was on the way to Damascus to persecute Christians. When Christ appeared to him on the Damascus road and told him to go into the city, and there it would be told him what he ought to do, and must do even, in order to be saved. And uh, so Ananias came to him and gave him that information, telling him, you know, why do you tarry, arise and be baptized and wash away uh, your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. He did exactly that. But... Uh, it wasn't long before there were those who were attempting to kill him. And uh, there were the brethren there in Damascus are said to have took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. So we know from that statement that the city of Damascus had walls around it. It was like many ancient cities in that time. You go back many, many years and you will find a great many walls that uh, are really very important in history. They're historical sites, and they are even considered in some instances to be wonders of uh, the old world. Walls do a lot of things. They protect us. They provide security. They support the roof over our heads. Look at this building for a moment. You see the walls round about us. Those walls give us protection, provide security, but they also do the very important work of supporting the roof over our heads. You need walls if you're going to have a house. And we all understand that. And we do have a sense of security when we're able to get home and get within the walls of our house. We feel a lot more secure. In, than we do just anywhere in the world. Walls provide two basic functions. They, number one, keep out. And number two, they keep in. Walls keep out those undesirables who maybe would come into our abode and harm us or hurt us. But walls also keep in. Think of a jail or a prison. They keep people in who would love to be out. Think of how many songs have been written about being in jail and longing to be out. Oh, but for those bars and those walls, they could be free. So walls do a lot of things. Uh, They're built of many different things. These walls are primarily wooden walls with brick, of course, outside. Uh, Walls may be built of wood. They may be built of brick and mortar. They may be built of solid concrete and reinforced with steel. As our 
the majority of skyscrapers, maybe all skyscrapers. A lot of concrete and steel are, are used in the building of those massive walls that will extend for many, many stories into the sky. So walls are really interesting. There's even a wall of water mentioned in the Bible. You remember that story, Exodus 14? The Scriptures say that that water stood up as a wall, a wall of water on either side of the children of Israel as they crossed through the Red Sea on dry ground. Now, God, only God could build a wall out of water. We see sometimes the floods, you know, the flash floods, and, and you've seen those pictures on TV, and I hope you've never experienced one. But all of a sudden, you just look around, and there is this massive wall of water coming upon you. And if you don't get out of the way, you're going to be swept away. We know how it is when Center Hill, Cordell Hull, opens the floodgates, and they start generating, and or maybe sometimes they have to open those to, to release some water because there's so much water behind the dam. And when you're there and you see that, I mean, there's a lot of water coming down upon you. But God made the waters of the Red Sea stand back as walls on either side, a wall of water. Think about that. Uh, some walls must be built. Some must be torn down. Well, we could talk about some of the great walls that have been built. The famous wall of China, the Great Wall of China, as it's called. The construction of it began, as best can be determined, in the 7th century B.C., 700 years before Christ. They started building that wall. It was built on their northern border to try to prevent the nomadic people who lived up there in that area from coming down upon them and invading their country. And it worked pretty well. It really helped out. But uh, they had a problem early on, I've read, that uh, some of the guards of the gates were not men of good character, and they could be bribed. And they would open the gates and let those people in. And, but that wall was built over a long period of time. Uh, some of the last work uh, was done on it began in the 1300s and continued into the 1600s. But it is a massive mo uh, wall, 5,500 5, miles in length with uh, approximately 4,000 miles of that length being a really genuine wall and uh, then you have rivers that serve as a barrier and sometimes uh, uh, trenches or ravines that would serve as part of it but uh, the actual wall is about 4,000 miles in length now that would be a massive massive wall we remember too the Berlin Wall remember Ronald Reagan's famous statement, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Most of us remember that. Built right through the middle of Berlin. People on one side were free. People on the other side wanted to gain freedom, uh, but they were kept uh, under communistic rule, basically by that wall, the Berlin Wall. But finally, it came down. And then the walls around ancient Babylon, said to be 41 miles in length. And uh, the walls of Babylon were one of the wonders of the ancient world. And the hanging gardens of Babylon, they had two uh, wonders of the world. Of those se uh, seven or eight wonders that are named sometimes, uh, Babylon laid claim to two of them the walls and their hanging gardens. Herodotus, uh, who was a Greek writer, said of those walls, he is thought to have visited them uh, during the reign of Cyrus before they were really torn down. 
He said they were 85 feet wide. You could drive several chariots abreast on top of those walls. And they were 335 feet tall. That's taller than a football field is long. Can you imagine walls that high? They were topped by 250 defense towers, as they were called. And those towers were large enough that you could turn a four-horse chariot in them. They were pretty good-sized towers. So you have some great walls in the world. The walls of Jerusalem, we read about them being destroyed and burned, the gates burned and so on, and then the walls being rebuilt during the days of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Zerubbabel. And uh, a wall that I want to really base our lesson on this morning is one that I discovered. It's a very not-so-famous wall, I don't guess. Uh, It's a wall that was in a drugstore Uh, out in Los Angeles, California. Here's the brief story of it. In 2012, a Los Angeles restaurant owner needed to do some remodeling, and he wanted to take down this particular wall that was in his store. That wall had been built in 1935. So he tore that wall down, and behind that wall he found a neon light that had been burning nonstop for 77 years. And the cost of that light burning all those years is estimated to have been $17,000. That much money was paid for electricity for a light that nobody could see And very few people, probably nobody knew was there for years and years and years. Here you have a wall that I think is quite symbolic and teaches us a very important lesson about something. And that is, this was a wall that hid a light that kept it from being appreciated by people in general because nobody saw it. I mean, what good is a neon light if nobody can see it? The purpose of a neon light is what? To get attention. You see those flashing neon lights in storefronts now? Even neon lights are being used today. But this one had burned nonstop out of sight for all those years. And nobody was able to see it. What does that tell us? That tells us that a wall can hide a light. A wall can hide a light. Now, Christians are to be lights. We're to be lights, aren't we? Look at what the Bible teaches. We are to be the light of the world, in the world, and to the world. Now, Jesus is the light of the world. But Christians are to be lights in this world as they reflect the life of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches us very clearly, you are the light of the world. Matthew 5, 14. Verse 16 continues, Let your light so shine, that is, in such a manner, shine in such a manner, before men. Men are observing our lives as Christians. Other people are going to be observing us, and they will critique our lives. They're going to take notice We all notice what people do. We all take note of things that people do and say, and we'll we'll even repeat that sometimes. It can be positive, it can be negative. But Christians come under the scrutiny of people of the world. 
Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. It is assumed that the disciples of Jesus are going to be involved in good works, not evil works. And glorify the Father which is in heaven. That's the primary purpose of the influence wielded by the Christian's life. To lead others to a knowledge and understanding of God. To lead them to bring honor and glory to God by departing from sin and leading a life of faithful service to the Lord. Christians are to be lights of the world, in the world, and to the world. That is our purpose for existing. Paul describes the world as being in the state of darkness, Ephesians 5, verse 11, Ephesians 6, verse 12. And, uh, and the words of our Lord in Matthew six twenty three. When he was talking about such darkness, he said, How great is that darkness! Exclamation point. The darkness in the world is great. I don't think any of us would really deny that, would we? The darkness in our present world is very great, just as it was in Jesus' day. And so the world needs light. Christians are children of light. And they are said to be light in the Lord. Ephesians 5 verse 8. Paul keeps talking about it and just places so much emphasis in the book of Ephesians on being in the Lord. In Him. In the Christ. In fact, something like 35 to 40 times that statement appears in the six brief chapters of the book of Ephesians. How do we maintain that light? How do we gain that light? How do we keep it burning? In the Lord. Outside Christ is darkness. Inside Christ is light. We're not only to be baptized into Christ to be saved from our sins. We are to walk in the light and continue in that light until death takes us from this walk on God's footstool. And then in Philippians chapter 2, I want us to look at that passage a moment. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. Paul has a great deal to say about Christians. He begins by saying in verse 14, Do all things without murmurings and disputings. There's nothing that distracts from our light any more than constant wrangling or murmuring or disputing. Look at the children of Israel and how often they argued with Moses. They murmured, they complained, they were just constantly uh, bickering about something. And many of them lost their lives in the wilderness because of that. Now, why should you not murmur and dispute that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom... You shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. Now that's life, L-I-F-E, not light, L-I-G-H-T, though the word of God does give light. It's a light unto our pathway and so on. Psalm 119, verse 105. Lamp unto our feet, light unto our pathway. But here he says, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. We live in a crooked and perverse nation, generation. What are we to do as Christians, among whom you shine as lights in the world? The Greek word that is translated 
light in that passage literally carries with it the idea of a light giver. The giver of light. How do you accomplish that? By holding forth the word of life, God's word. Demonstrating it in your life. Adorning the doctrine, as Paul described it on one occasion. You know, there are a lot of things that are good and useful, but they can be, quote, dressed up a little. There are some foods, you know, that uh, they're not too attractive if you just get to looking at them, but when those people that are, you know, master chefs get through with putting all this garnish work on it and so on, man, it it looks really good. (coughs) And the thing that Paul emphasized in that passage to uh, Titus about adorning the doctrine, he was telling him, demonstrate the doctrine of Christ in your life so that it will attract people not to you, but to the Lord. You adorn the doctrine of Christ. We need to be demonstrating the gospel of Christ to all those before whom we live. Let's look at some walls that block the light for just a moment. I want to mention four to you this morning. I want you to think about them. Wall number one is the wall of indifference. There's a very apparent attitude of indifference in our world today. But friends, we're not talking about the world. We're talking about the Lord's church. There should not be any indifference in the Lord's church because of who and what the church is. The church is made up of those who have been redeemed, Ephesians 1, verse 7. Redeemed from sin. The church is made up of those who are the body of Christ, paid for by His blood, Acts 20, verse 28, over which Christ rules and reigns as the head, Colossians 1, 18. All of those things remind us that the church is made up of God's own special people. People who have been redeemed. People who have been bought back from the guilt and condemnation of sin. We should never, ever allow indifference to creep into our lives. Think of how many blessings God has given us through His Son. How could we ever forget that? The brethren in Laodicea evidently did. You read Revelation chapter 3, beginning in about verse 14, going through verse 22. These were people redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. They made up the body of Christ in Laodicea. Laodicea was so wealthy that one time when the city was destroyed, I believe, by an earthquake, they wouldn't even take any money at all from the Roman government. They rebuilt the city themselves. Now, they kindly relished those riches, though. They evidently liked to flaunt them. They said, we're rich and increased with goods and we have need of nothing. Now, these are not just the citizens of Laodicea talking. That is the Christians in Laodicea talking. And the Lord is depicted as standing outside the door. Now, we know He wasn't talking about a literal door. The church is the house of God. But the church building is not the house of God in the sense that that's the primary purpose of the meaning of the word church. We drive down our streets and say, well, look at that church there. What you're looking at is the church building. You're not looking at the church because the church is made up of people. So 
Jesus says, I'm not even welcome in my own church. And there are a lot of people today who mistakenly talk about my church and your church and our church and so on. The church belongs to the Lord. And here is a case where he is depicted as being shut out of his church because the members thereof had become so lukewarm and indifferent that maybe... They thought, you know, it just wouldn't kosher to have so much of an emphasis on Jesus anymore. There's a lot of people who feel the same way today. They think he's outdated, that his word is outdated. That the things that are taught in Scripture about his church are outdated. The Laodicean complex is still alive and well. When we build that wall of indifference, then the world does not see our light shining. Whether you're talking about an individual Christian or talking about a congregation of God's people. The second wall that I want you to take note of is the wall of idleness. Uh, There's much idleness in the world today. Brother Jerry Phillips and I had to take a detour the other day when we were going to Nashville and uh, get over into a section where we drove along one of the formerly main thoroughfares in Nashville. And I said, Brother Jerry, do you notice how many people are just standing around and sitting around? And before the day was over, we even saw one or two lying around a fellow sleeping right between two busy streets. There. So much traffic, you know, I thought, I hope the man isn't dead. But there he was, right there on Church Street, sleeping just right on the curb. But you see so much idleness anymore, don't you? Paul said, if a man won't work, neither let him eat. Boy, that doesn't go very far today, does it? Stop and think about it. But remember, we're not talking about the world in general. We're talking about the Lord's church. We're talking to all of us as Christians. We must never allow ourselves to build that wall of idleness. Christians are to be busy. They are to be diligent. They are to be industrious just like Jesus was. In Luke 2, we learn in verse 49 that he was about his father's business at about the age of 12. You know, that is about the time that many young people begin to think about becoming a Christian. They begin to realize, I know right from wrong now. I know that there are things that I should do and things that I should not do. And that conscience begins to really become active. They begin to think about whether they should be about the Father's business. Young people, you need to think about that. And then you see the diligence with which Jesus did things. He went about doing good. Acts 10.38 says. And so many times he was interrupted when he was no doubt, quote, dog tired. And yet he still found time and the energy for people, didn't he, who were in need. Whether it was one who came to him by night or whether it was a multitude that he observed after a long day of preaching and teaching, He had compassion upon them and he took care of them. There was a diligence there. Somebody has said quite well, I think, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. We need to keep our minds active and occupied with good things. Think on those things that are good and honest and lovely and of good report that Paul talks about in Philippians 4, verses 6 through 8. We certainly cannot afford to become idle. 
Stop and think about this question. Do people know that we're Christians when they observe our lives and think about the amount of time and the diligence with which we go about living day to day and trying our best to serve the Lord? Gar Agee, I think, was the first who called this to my attention. He had seen it somewhere. And the question was this. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Would there be enough evidence to convict you if you were arrested for being a Christian? That's a powerful, powerful thought, isn't it? We cannot afford to eat the bread of idleness. How involved are you in the work of the Lord? Just ask that question and then honestly answer it. And then there is a third wall, the wall of immorality. We know that the walls of that that wall of water, think about it. The wall of immorality is relentlessly pounding the shores of our society and destroying our freedoms, eroding not so gradually the principles of righteousness and truth found and revealed in the Scriptures. We see it just about on every hand. We see it every day. We expect that from the world because that's the way of the world. Read Romans chapters 1 and 2. That's the way the world behaves. But we do not expect that from the church and from Christians. At least not if they are in touch with the Lord and His Word. Paul was very forthright, wasn't he, in 1 Corinthians 5. He said simply, and I'm paraphrasing now, but here's the gist of his message. Immorality has no business in the Lord's church. That's what he told those brethren at Corinth. He said, that's the way the pagans live. That's the way the world lives. But it has no business, and you're proud and puffed up and haven't taken care of the matter before you. So put away that man who is living in open fornication because... That's the way of the world. That's not the way of God's people. Wouldn't just in reference to sexual sins, look at how God dealt with the principle or the lying of Ananias and Sapphira. Great fear came upon the Lord's church. They suddenly realized God does not approve, nor will He tolerate indefinitely, lying. Lying has no place in the church, He said. So we're reminded by these two examples, and many more could be said, that those things are wrong. And so, if we, but if we erect a wall of immorality, what does that do? It prevents our light from shining. Paul said it like this, Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? You know, what we do may lead people in general to judge all people in the church by our lives. That brings us to the final wall. The wall of irresponsibility. Connection with that preceding point? That makes all of us responsible. The wall of irresponsibility. The world is suffering tremendously from a lack of responsibility. I was thinking a few days ago that from a financial standpoint, if every American acted responsibly, we probably could retire the national debt. Just bam, like that. Take full responsibility and accountability for their own lives and say, wait a minute, I can't afford to... to bring a burden on other people. I'm going, to, I'm going to quit this way of living that's costing the state no telling what. And I'm going to be a responsible citizen. 
Brother Alan Hires was telling over at Murfreesboro, I heard the, I didn't get to go in person, but I heard it the other day, about uh, Brother W.A. Bradfield coming to where Brother Hires was and holding the gospel meeting many years ago. Brother Bradfield wanted a list of people that were prospects before he got there. When he got there, he went to see every one of them. Brother Hires said, I went with him. So there was this one gentleman who was older and never obeyed the gospel. Said we went over to his house. And Brother Bradfield just began talking to him, said, We want you to come to this gospel meeting. You know, started patting him on the shoulder and saying, you know, you're a, you're a good fellow. You're a good husband. Patting him on the shoulder all the time. He said, Good husband. Good father, good citizen, good shoulders. <laughs> he even commended his shoulders. But he said, now I want you to come to that meeting and I want you to sit pretty close to the front. He said, you need to be a Christian because of your family. You need to obey the gospel. You need to start living a life for the Lord. Brother Bradfield was a powerful salesman and a powerful preacher. Sure enough, the man came. And he sat about five, six rows back in the pretty good size auditorium, right there in front of Brother Bradfield. Brother Bradfield preached his sermon. And when the invitation song started, he walked right down the aisle, looked that man directly in the eye, and said, Are you coming? And the man came. He obeyed the gospel and died a faithful Christian. That man assumed responsibility is the point of my telling that. He said, I want to be everything I should be for my family for myself, for the Lord. So many times we act irresponsibly. Jesus didn't mince any words. He told His disciples, your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Your righteousness must exceed that. And then He also said, you are to go the second mile. You're to do more than is expected. Just getting by, just doing enough to get by is not good enough. Christians must exceed in order to succeed in their service to the Lord. Friends, brothers and sisters, we're all responsible for attending, for working, for praying, for visiting, for worshiping in spirit and in truth, singing and making metal in our hearts, encouraging one another, all that we can. Now, remember, to use that phrase from President Reagan, Tear down these walls. The wall of indifference, the wall of idleness, the wall of immorality, the wall of irresponsibility. These walls must be torn down because they're blocking the view of something the world desperately needs to see. What is it? The light. Just like that wall in that restaurant in, San, in Los Angeles had been blocking that light for 77 years. These walls will block the light that the world desperately needs. Three things. Come to the light, then walk in the light, that the world may see the light in you. That's what we need to do. If you're subject to the sweet invitation of our Lord, either as an alien sinner our erring child of God, please come and let us help you in any way that is needed through what God has taught in His Word. 
Come if you're subject as we stand and sing. Contribution will be number 359. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the opportunity we have in life to earn portions of this world good. Father, we're thrilled that we have the opportunity this time to give back unto Thee. Thy work can be carried on here and wherever else it is needed. Father, we pray that as we give back to Thee, that we are acceptable in our worship and giving to Thee, and we're pleasing in Thy sight. For in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Holy Father, we're thankful that each first day of the week that we can come together and remember the great sacrifice that was given on the cross of Calvary. At this time, Father, we give thee thanks for bread, which represents this precious body that hung on that cross for each of our sins. May we carry our minds back to that cross and partake of it in a worthy manner, for in Christ's name we pray. Holy Father, we give thee thanks now for the fruit of the vine, which represents that precious blood that was shed for our sins and for all the world. Help us to continue to remember that great sacrifice that you've taken, that it will be acceptable in thy sight. For in Christ's name we pray. Seven hundred eighty will be our closing song. Seven hundred eighty, and uh, our closing prayer will be led uh, by Blake Richmond. We appreciate very much your presence this morning, especially again those that are visiting with us. Please come back and be with us every opportunity that you have. Uh, we have some news about some sick folks, and we'll uh, read through these as quickly as possible, and also some people who have passed away. Uh, 
and we want to remember those families. Uh, We've been asked to add uh, Arnold Rich to our prayer list. He was diagnosed with cancer this past Wednesday. Uh, Jimmy Rigsby is now in McFarland re- Rehab in Lebanon, room 251. And let's continue to remember all those that uh, have been on our prayer list for some time. Susan Marvin, we have a message from her mother, Carol Woodard. She is improving, but still on a low of amount, amount of oxygen and antibiotics for the pneumonia. But the blood work is looking better, so let's remember continue to remember her. Brenda Bowman is at home. Mary Phillips is in rehab out at Kindred. Irene Gregory is out there. Is, or no, she is at home now with R.W. and Gail. Uh, Imogene Dixon, uh, not feeling well today. Leslie Alford, Scotty and Gay Yeaman, Gary Lester, Ray Upchurch, Emma Hall, Bob Harville, Jenny Burnett, Brandon Powell, who has, we have just learned uh, yesterday morning had passed away and we certainly want to remember that family in our prayers. Josh Dillard, Earl Carter, Froney Rose, Karen Howell, Francis Rollins, Kathy Stafford, uh, and Wilma Richardson. Let's remember all of these. The funeral arrangements for Brandon has not been made yet, so uh, uh, you can check the obituary line at Sanderson's for that. Uh, this note, uh, we will be meeting at the Pumpkin Patch on Saturday, October 1st at 3 o'clock. And please see Justin Malden for directions or to get uh, set up with a carpool. Uh, Jessa Clam will celebrate her birthday on the 26th. Julie Harville and Aubrey Hicks on the uh, uh, 27th. James Rowland on the 28th. Imogene Dixon on the 29th and Jerry Phillips on the first day of October. There will be a baby girl shower in honor of Pam Morris Sunday, October 16th, following evening services. The ladies are asked to uh, bring, uh, uh, please bring finger foods. And we'll remind uh, the ladies again that the uh, gift brunch for Susan Woodard, Marvin, and her baby uh, that were scheduled for October 8th has been postponed due, due to her hospitalization. And we need to remember to bring liquid laundry detergent, as many of you already have, uh, for Tennessee Children's Home. Uh, this thank you note to the Carthage congregation, thank you so much for remembering our daddy and granddaddy with the delicious sandwich trays. We appreciate your kindness. This is from the family of Mr. Bob Dillahay, who was buried yesterday. Any, there's been a couple or three that have said they would be interested in uh, posting a vote no on liquor uh, in, sign in their yard. If any of the rest of you would like to, to uh, do that, please let me know so we'll know how many of those signs to uh, acquire. Uh, meeting at uh, Rush Creek will be October 2 through 5 with Kerry Duke preaching and our gospel meeting. Uh, We'll be here before we know it, November 6 through 9, and uh, that will be with Brother Gary Hampton. Elaine will have some of these brochures or flyers to pass out. Uh, They'll be out on the stand in the foyer, and uh, be sure to uh, begin advertising as quickly as possible. Uh, Tonight, we'll meet at 545 Children's Class, then 6 o'clock for the evening service. Let's all plan to be here. Remember also the funeral or memorial service for... uh, Pat Dyer will be this afternoon. Uh, visitation begins at 2, and the uh, service will be at 4 o'clock in the gymnasium at the uh, high school in Macon County, or in Lafayette. Let's keep that in mind. If there's no further announcements, let's stand for the closing song in prayer.
Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for a beautiful day you've blessed us with to gather here and learn more about your word made. What we've heard this morning, uh, taken into account to our everyday lives as we, we go out and, and spread the word throughout your world. Be with us as we go to our our Bible classes. May we learn more there and keep us safe as we uh, gather here once more this evening, if it be your will. I want to thank you most of all for your son down on the cross for the remission of all of our sins. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.